across the aisle. Shake hands, please, everybody. Welcome you. We're delighted to be back in the Lord's house tonight. We welcome each and every one of you and our visitors tonight. Uh, indicated this morning, we still have a several, several families gone and out of town, but we're delighted that you're here. I'd like to, I, tr I just try our best to, to be kind to all the neighboring churches. I hope they do the same for us anyway, but uh, this, this um, bluegrass gospel workshop, if you play any instruments at all, uh, you can go if you're eight, especially the young people behind me, if you're 18 and under, you go free. So, uh, and if you're eight, 19, it's only $5. And that's August 10th and 11th at Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville. Maybe you could send your son or your daughter, drop them off or go with them. And all the information's here. It's a gospel bluegrass workshop. And I'm sure some of the kids will be interested, all right? Worship the Lord with the youth choir. May the Lord bless you while they sing.
Amen. Thank you, young people. We appreciate it. And also uh, choir, adult, adult choir, and all the musicians. We thank you for your service and for your uh, using your talents and being involved. And can you imagine coming to church and no music or nobody to play or direct or nobody to sing? It'd be a pretty pitiful sight, wouldn't it? So we praise God for how he's blessed our church. Amen. Praise God for it. We have a ring up here. It's got two little hearts, and it's a silver. Maybe it's all silver. I'm not sure, but it looks like a, a, a girl's ring. I hope that's not a guy's ring. <laughs> I believe it's a girl's, so you get that all right. And remember now the, um, the bulletins, you, all the information. I'm not going to reannounce everything again, but everything that uh, is, uh, is of importance is in that bulletin. And so if you'll get one, and you'll have all the announcements, all the dates, all that's going on here at Mountain View Baptist Church in the next few weeks, all right? Also, would like to remind you that immediately after the service, we'll take some of the men. The doors are already unlocked. The, the chairs in the fellowship hall are finished already. Ms. Holden and her family did that. Thank you so much. I didn't even realize that. But the chapel chairs are in the hall, and we need to just move the chapel chairs into the two or three of the rooms, and that's it, okay? Nothing to be done in the fellowship hall, but in the, in the hallway is where we put all the chapel chairs they need to be moved onto the carpet because they're going to be cleaning all those floors, the entire facility this week, all right? Let's have the ushers come on in. We'll get the regular tithe and the regular offering. Appreciate you doing that. And then also, many of you might have noticed this new door out here. That will not be permanent, all right? That will not be permanent. We didn't like the way they finally put it up and made it look, changed the whole appearance. They're supposed to come back this week and change it back out for what we had. So uh, how'd that happen? It just did, all right? I don't know what else to tell you, but uh, it just did. And so uh, we, we thought we'd match all the doors. Well, we did. We matched all the doors, but it just changed the appearance too drastic. And so uh, if you came in cussing and fussing, uh, quit all you cussing and quit all you fussing, it's going to be, we're going to stay with the old past. Say amen. <laughs> we'll on, on that particular door and that one too, all right? So all that's happening, make everybody smile, all right? Play for us, Lord. Somebody come get your ring, all right? Come get your ring. Brother's going to dedicate the offering, and those that are going to the Ringo camp meeting, if you'll meet in the choir immediately after service, and don't take long in doing that, and of course you won't, but because we're going to get the chairs done, all right? Brother Ben's going to pray for us, dedicate the offering, then the King James boys are coming to sing for us, all right? Lord, we love you this evening. God, we thank you for every time you've answered prayer. God, we, we, we don't take it for granted, Lord, that you've answered prayer on our behalf over and over again. God, the things that you've done in the church. God, the things you've done for families. God, the lost that we've seen saved. God, we don't take it for granted that an almighty God would answer our prayer and bend his ear towards us. And God, I thank you for that this evening. God, I give you glory. God, there's nobody else can do what you can do. And we thank you for that. God, we ask you once again tonight, Lord, we don't, 
want to just, Lord, play on your graces, but God, we need your help in these last days. God, in the dark time that we live in, we ask you, God, would you move in this church service tonight? God, you'd anoint my preacher to preach. God, you'd give him power and liberty to preach. God, you'd touch his voice. God, you'd touch his mind as he preaches to us. What thus saith the Lord? God, would you touch every song that's sung? God, for the rest of the service, it'd be lifting you up and giving you glory. God, we want to see you, God, in his last days. God, we want you to touch. God, not only our generation, but the generations following us. God, so for those that are in this service this evening, God, would you touch us? God, make us thirsty and hungry for you, and God, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Yeah. God, for the lost that are here, I ask you, God, you'd go to where they are even right this second. God, you convict their hearts, show them their need of a Savior. God, for the backslidden that are walking a cool distance from you, God, would you use your cords of love to draw them close to you? God, for those that need comfort, God, would you comfort them? God, for those that need conviction, you convict them. God, we need your hand tonight. And God, we beg you by the blood of your Son. And Lord, what he did at Calvary, Lord, would you please, for his sake, God, do something in this service tonight. God, we look to you to do a great and mighty thing at the Mountain View Baptist Church this evening. First in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, King James 16 11, boys. All right, sing it, guys. And singing, all right? All right, we're going to get uh, Miss Lisa to fill in. Brother Kevin's just now getting over some laryngitis, and we appreciate him being able to even be here, but she's going to fill in for him, and they're going to sing one for us, all right? Come on, y'all. Many times when you wonder, you made it this far that was God when you realize it wasn't as bad as it seemed that was God when you were sitting all alone with not a friend to talk to 
suddenly a stranger comes with words that uplifts you to seem help just comes from out of the blue that was god oh that's god he's walking in my darkest night his spirit is descending in power and might and his love it surrounds me and wraps my soul safe and tight Oh, that's God, he made a way for eternal life, sent his son to die. What a great sacrifice, he nailed all my sins to the cross, brother, that's God. When your body came out of that sickness oh that was God and when you had no money and someone provided that was God when you were hungry and tired and no rest could be found but now there's food on your table and a place to lay down so look around at all of your blessings brother that's God Oh, that's God, he's walking in my darkest night His spirit is descending with power and might And his love, it surrounds me and wraps my soul safe and tight Oh, that's God, he made a way for eternal life Sent his son to die what a great sacrifice who nailed all my sins to the cross brother that's god oh that's god he's walking in my darkest night his spirit is descending with power and might it is a love it surrounds me and wraps my soul safe and tight oh that's god he made a way for eternal life sent his son to die. What a great sacrifice. Who nailed all my sins to the cross? Brother, that's God. Who nailed all my sins to the cross? Brother, that's God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. You say amen to that. Appreciate it. God bless your heart, all your groups. Take your Bibles, everybody. We're going to go right back to Matthew 23. Unfinished business here in Matthew 23, all right? Hope you have a copy of God's Word with you tonight. Please share it with somebody if they don't have one next to you, okay? Matthew 23, I'll cover your prayers tonight. I thought it was very, very serious preaching this morning. Very serious preaching. Uh, can I tell you something tonight? This is a mirror right here. This is a mirror. God's Word is a mirror. And you know, if we look into the mirror and see our reflection, yep. especially on this subject right here, now I tell you, you better dive in the altar somewhere. Before you're not able, before you're not able to dive in an altar somewhere. And you get beyond the place where God doesn't even deal with you anymore. Could I get an amen to that? Serious business, friend, serious business right here. I've never preached this, never have. And it's brand new to me too. But it's so enlightening, so enlightening. And holding up the mirror, and that's my purpose, is to hold up the mirror. And I'd like to say to this audience tonight, and uh, all of us need to quit being pansies, amen? Right. Quit being pansies. What do you mean by that? It means that, that if, if I'm the one that I can see myself in this, I need to do something about it. And then if we're concerned about family or friends or somebody that we see all these traits, and we need to quit saying things like this, well, that's just them, you know how they are. That's the wrong thing to say. If that's them, they better get in the altar. I'm telling you now, this is serious business. Serious business. God help us. I mean, God help us. Let's pray, or I want us to pray. Brother Senior, Randy Senior, stand and pray with us, please, sir, if you will.
pray that you fill him tonight, Lord. Give him, God. We pray that you give him up to tonight, Lord. Give him a glory to fire. God grant it, Lord. God grant it. Thank you, praise the word. And Lord, we do take it serious. Lord, we do believe in the miracle book. God, we do know it changed his life. It changed theirs. God, we, for 43 years, we've watched him change his life. God, we've seen him help families and help individuals, help homes and help churches. And God, we pray that you do it again. God, we pray that you do it here tonight. Manifest your presence. Have your will and your way tonight. Help us to heal, Lord. God, help us to heal to you. And let you have your way in our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray this word, Lord, would have an effectual. God grant it. God grant it, Lord. Please let it have an effectual. Amen. I want you to keep your Bibles open because these characteristics are going to be very, uh, very enlightening, all right? Very enlightening, and I know that they apply specifically, Brother David, to the Pharisees of Jesus' day, but when you look at the Scripture, you can see resemblances even in our day, all right? Uh, I, I, I'm preaching on the eight woes upon the Pharisees, the eight woes upon the Pharisees, and I told you this morning that I dealt first of all about their deception. They were called hypocrites. I dealt with their denunciation. The Bible said, woe, it said it about seven times, a word of grief and denunciation. And then right now I'm gonna deal with their destructive behavior, their destructive behavior. And then I've already said a word about their damnation or their doom. Their damnation or their doom is how so you escape the damnation of hell, all right? I wanna jump right into it because it's very enlightening. Look in verse number 13, everybody. Uh, Matthew 23. And verse number 13, but woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you then that are entering in, entering to go in. Now don't get too fast right there. Don't get too fast because there's something there that you're not even going to believe. Here's what it is, Brother Ben. This is the woe of preventing, the woe of preventing. Brother David, not only did these Pharisees not get into the kingdom of heaven, but they stood in the way of anybody else. God, help. God, help. I don't know what else to say to you. I, I hope that's not you. And I hope that's not, I know, I know it's not me. It's not me. I'm telling you that. It's not me. I'm not trying to stand in the way of anybody. But here's what's remarkable about the verse. Look in verse number 13. Ne uh, for ye neither yourselves go in, ne for ye neither go in yourself, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Now, buddy, if you want to leave the word entering out, I mean, we're not going to. We're not going to hurt the Bible, all right? Say amen. We're not, we're not trying to deconstruct or construct. We're not taking a pen knife and cutting anything out. But if you were just to, a moment, just go right over that word, and it says, neither suffer you them that are, that are to go in. So my point is this, Brother Jeff Dover, these Pharisees and these scribes, they were preventing people that were on the very verge of getting in. The very verge. Brother Kyle, the Bible said, you're preventing people that are in the process, Brother Brian, of entering in. And I say tonight, Woe be to the individual. Woe be to the church member. Woe be to your family and my family. If I am a hindrance and an obstacle and I, and I, and listen, here's the word. I am a stumbling block of somebody else entering in. Now look up here, friend. You know what makes me a stumbling block? My hypocritical ways. That's what hypocrisy does. That's what always hypocrisy does. That's what it did in the fair. They were, they were, they, 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 they were not going in themselves, and they weren't very happy if anybody else wasn't to enter in. Uh, can I ask you some very pointed questions again tonight? And by the way, I've been burdened about this all day long, and I knew I'd come back and preach this again tonight. But wouldn't you hate it for it to be said about you? that you prevent people from getting into the kingdom of God. How would we like to go, Brother David, to the judgment seat of Christ and stand before the judgment seat of Christ and him to say to me, because of the life that you lived, because of the lying that you did, because you wasn't honest, because you were one thing at church and something else at the job, 
Because you were one thing in front of those people and something else in front of your wife or in front of your husband or in front of your pastor. You were two different things. And him to say to me, I want to show you how many people you became an obstacle for them getting into the kingdom of God. You know what? Look at me. You know what we're going to have? We're going to have blood on our hands. But now watch this. Now that's one application, Brother Kiner. That's one application. But listen to this. These people that are not going in and are preventing others from going in, they're not saved to begin with. They're hypocrites. And that's what a hypocrite does. You live a hypocritical life in front of the people outside of this church. I'm going to tell you something. and Nobody's going to believe the words that's coming out of your mouth. And you are actually going to be the cause of damning people's soul to hell. Got to get an amen. You are actually going to be the stumbling block to sending other people to hell. Is it any wonder what, that there's degrees of punishment in the lake of fire? Is there any wonder? No, it's no wonder, Brother Josh. Look in verse number 13, the woe of preventing. But look in verse number 14, all right? I'm going to hurry. Look in verse 14. And this is all, gen- I mean, not generic, but, but interpreted in, 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 in the Pharisees' time, but it has an application to us. Verse 14, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. You take, you take, you take, um, help me with the words, Lord. You take advantage of the weak. You take advantage of the weak, but watch what you do. You, you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Now, here's the story there. Here's the story, Brother Rick. Here's the story. It, it, is, the, it, is, the, it is the woe of pretense. You're taking money from the widows. I can't even believe this. You're taking money from the weak. You're taking money from the widows, but in front of everybody else, You're saying long prayers. Who could live that way, church? Who who would live that way? Who who would want to live that way? Hey, how can you live with yourself? How can you live with yourself to come down here to the sanctuary and make long prayers, but in reality, you're a thief? In reality, you're pilfering and taking from the widow. Do you get, do you understand what I'm preaching, church? Do you understand the depth of this? On the outside, right back to where I was this morning, on the outside, everybody sees and hears your prayers. But on the inside, you have thievery and pilfering and taking advantage of the weak. You're, you're, doing, you're, you're doing things you should not be doing. Now, that's a hypocrite. Right or wrong. That's a hypocrite. <clears throat> Standing in a pulpit. Yeah. Teaching a Sunday school class. Yeah. Leading singing. Yeah. Taking up the usher and taking up the money. Right. Being an usher. Yeah. Singing specials. Playing instruments. Right. Being called on to pray. In front of everybody else, all that looks great. But you're doing things and you're living in a way that only God in heaven knows. I hope that's nobody in this building. I pray that's nobody in this building. I pray that's not my children. I pray that's not your children. I pray that's not in any of the offices of our church, any of the officers of our church. I've heard testimony after testimony through the years. I'm talking about through the years, okay? Everybody stay with me, okay? I've heard testimony after testimony of people that say that my daddy or or my mother or even my folks or somebody that I loved, somebody I was close to, if folks only knew what they were in the house. (laughs) If folks only knew what they really were like. They had Preacher Robbins full. They had Preacher Griffith full. They had their Sunday school class full. They had all the ushers full. Everybody okay? But I live with them. See, that's what I'm talking about. The people that live with you, they know what you are. Sir, she knows what you are. Young young lady, he knows what you are. Listen, you're, listen to this. Your children know what you are. 
Your children know if you're real. Everybody pray, all right? Your children know if you're real. Your children know if you're genuine. Your children, I ain't talking, to listen, I'm not talking about perfection. Say amen. No, sir, I'm not talking about perfection. Because none of us are going to arrive to the plateau of perfection. That's not what I'm dealing with. What I'm dealing with is Phariseeism. And common to what I think it is, the Phariseeism of the Bible was that they were out, they were outwardly okay in front of the eyes of everybody else, but inwardly, inwardly, they were full of corruption, full of uncleanness. Listen to this. They weren't, they, they weren't real. They weren't, they was not real. They was not real. It was not genuine. The woe of preventing, the woe of pretense, or the way, the woe of, when I say pretense, I'm talking about pretend that you have sanctity, pretend that you have sanctification, pretend that you, you're offering up prayers. And by the way, look at me. What good is anybody's prayer in this church that we've called on tonight? What good is anybody's prayer in this church if you're a thief? What? Wouldn't it be better just to come to me or come to somebody and say, don't call on me to pray anymore? Don't call on me to pray anymore. Because I'm, I'm a thief. I'm doing things. I'm taking advantage of weak people. I can't even, I can't even wrap my mind around this, Brother Rick, that people do this, that people live this way. God forbid that it be said, uh, hey, 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 hey. God forbid that when I'm holding up the mirror that some of you are seeing yourself in this. God forbid, I hope not, I pray not. God says you're a two-fold child of hell is what he said. The woe, number one, of preventing the woe of pretense. Look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. This is unusual, verse 15. Brother Derek, Brother Philip, very unusual, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, watch this now, I told you what I just quoted, you make him twofold more of the child of hell than yourselves. How are you going to make somebody a twofold child of hell more than yourself if that's not what you are yourself? You are. The woe of proselyting. Explain that, preacher. Well, as it applies right here, Brother Tommy Cook, to this passage, the, 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 the Pharisees, Brother Wheeler, wanted to proselyte, bring somebody out of Gentilism into Judaism, but they, not, they didn't just want to bring them into, into the law and into Judaism just for the sake of Judaism. They wanted Miss Stephanie, Brother Chris Madden, they wanted to bring them under their brand, their, their trademark, their sect, S-C-C-T, and that was Phariseeism. And Jesus said, nothing wrong with bringing them into Judaism, but when you bring them into Phariseeism, you're making them a twofold child of hell like yourself. The woe of proselyting. You know what that means? You know what that means, Brother Nick? That means there's people that are hypocrites. There's people that are hypocrites and they're full of corruption on the inside and it doesn't bother them if somebody else is just like them. And they compass that land and sea. They compass land and sea to bring somebody over to their side. Say amen, somebody. They compass land and sea, Miss Crystal, Miss Crystal Owens, to proselyte, to not bringing them out of another religion. That's not what I'm talking about. But to get them to come to their side, to come to their side, to see things as they see things. And listen to me, the Phariseeism, for all of their ceremonial cleanness, for all of their ritualistic cleanness, Brother David, for all of their uh, law abiding, they look great to everybody on the outside. But God said, when you bring somebody into your belief, you're making them a twofold child of hell more than yourself. Now, buddy, that's an indictment, and that's stronger than I can even preach. Brother Perry, that's stronger than I can even preach. The woe of proselyting. Look at number four. Look at verse 16, everybody. Look at your Bible, verse 16. Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. Whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. In other words, they put more emphasis on the gold rather than the temple. Verse 17, you fools and blind, 
For whether it's greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifieth the gold. Verse 18, whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. Whosoever swear by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind. For whether it's greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. The altar is church. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, swear by it and by all things thereof. Verse 21, whoso shall swear by the temple, swear by it and by him that these are talking about oaths that they would take. Verse 22, and he that shall swear by heaven, swear by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereof. Now listen, you're going to really have to listen right here. You really have to listen. In verse 16 down through verse 22, you know what is under consideration? Let me tell you what's under consideration. It's the woe of perverting. The woe of perverting. They perverted the clear doctrine and the clear teaching of the Word of God, and our churches are full of it. Full of it. I'm telling you, I do not have time tonight. I do not have time. And neither do you have time for me to explain all in depth, verse 16 through down verse 22. Suffice it to say, these were oaths, O-A-T-H-F, that the people would make. Swearing, really. And in another passage, said, don't swear by heaven or earth. Don't do that. And so all these oaths and these interpretations, the gold is more important than the temple. The sacrifice. Sacrifice more important than the altar, and on and on. The, the, the point is, they perverted the doctrine. They perverted the truth. They, 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 they distorted it. They put their spin on it. Somebody help me. They put their spin on it. They, they looked at it through their eyes. And listen, listen, you're a Pharisee. You're a Pharisee. You are a Pharisee. That's what you are. You are a Pharisee if you pervert the clear teaching of the Word of God. That's what you do. That's what you do. And let me tell you why they, Miss Rhonda, let me tell you why they perverted. Brother Brian, let me tell you why they pervert the clear teaching of these, of these passages. All, and listen, this is, this is honest. Brother Stewart, that verse 16 through 22, about two hours worth of preaching. I don't have time, okay? You understand that, right? But let me tell you why they pervert it. Let me tell you why they pervert it, why they contort it and twist it and, and, and put their spin on it. To suit what they wanted to do. And to suit how they wanted to live. In other words, in other words, Brother Joseph, instead of letting this book regulate their life, they wanted the, the, their own distorted views to regulate everybody else's life. And that is a perversion, friend. This is the authority. Say amen. This is the authority. You say, well, I don't see it now. I know you don't. I know you don't. Say, who in the devil are you talking to? It don't matter, friend. Uh, you say, I don't see it that way. I, I don't believe it that way. I don't accept it that way. Well, maybe you're a Pharisee. You only interpret things to suit your fancy. You only interpret things to, to accommodate your lifestyle. You only accept things as you agree as long as it don't infringe on your, on your uh, so-called Christianity. The woe of perverting. We've covered the woe of preventing, the woe of pretense, the woe of proselyting. And then number four, the woe of perverting the scripture. Turn the page, verse 23, everybody. Let's get to the nitty gritty right here. Let's really get to the nitty gritty. Let's get where the rubber meets the road, all right? Look at verse 23. Watch this now. You ain't gonna believe, you're not gonna believe this. Listen, you're not gonna believe this one right here. This is what they do. This is how they live, Miss Kathy. Verse 23. Is everybody in verse 23? I mean, really, I want you to look at it now. Don't take my word. Be like the Bereans. Search the scriptures, all right? See whether these things are so. Here's what they did. You're talking about an appearance before men. Verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe, and it's going to get very quiet. It's going to get deathly quiet. We're fixing to kill the night. And I'm going to start looking at some people too. Now watch what they do though. Watch what they do. For ye pay tithe of mint. Now somebody hand me a man. Somebody hand me a man. Quickly, quickly, quickly. A man, anything, anything you got. Anything you got. Anything you got. I didn't think, there you go. Thank you. Way to go. Thank you. All right. Do you think that's what they're talking about? No. 
They're not. I mean, who would be so stupid as to tithe off of that? <laughs> it's not what he's talking about. Watch, these, watch, watch, the, watch the scrupulousness of these people. Right. Watch the minute detail of these people. That word mint is an interesting word. It means deal, D-I-L-L, -L, not deal, brother deal. It's deal, D-I-L-L. -L. It's an aromatic herb for cooking. Brother Barry, that's all it is, an aromatic herb for cooking. Let's go to the next word. He said you take tithe of not only men, of anise. And anise is uh, 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 another herb that flavored salads. I like that, that flavored salads. But then the next one, and a little humor here, uh, I don't put so many notes, I can't read it now. Cumin or cumin. I thought that was cumin, and I said, praise God. <laughs> start, start tithing on my cumin and say amen. Uh, you're supposed to laugh, all right? But it's not cumin. It's cumin. And the word cumin there, let me get it right, is another herb, an aromatic herb used in medicine. For one, so one of these herbs was used in cooking. Stay with me. Right. One, Brother Brian, one of these herbs was used for medicinal purposes, Miss Meredith, and the other one was used as a flavoring in salad. Now I want you to take me to the scripture. I want you to take me to the Old Testament scripture that told them to tithe off herbs and to tithe off salad flavorings. But I can take you to the scripture and say, show you where they were supposed to tithe off the first fruits of the corn, of the barley. Is everybody okay? Of the livestock, of the flock and the herd. Is that the Bible? I'm, I'm asking, is that the Bible? That's the Bible. But nowhere that I can find, and I've looked, and I hope you want to look later, nowhere, Brother Andy Spencer and Miss Pam, that I can look where they were supposed to tithe off the herbs of the field, the herbs of, of the garden. Nowhere there. So look what he said. Look at the look at the crux of the matter. He said, uh, and he's saying to you, he's not, he not praising him. He's saying, woe to you, for you tithe off of these things, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. In other words, everybody can see you tithing off the herbs, but you forgot about judgment, and you forgot about mercy to people, and you forgot about living by faith. I wish I had somebody. In other words, though, oh God, those are the things that come from the inside. Judgment comes from the inside. Using discernment, mercy comes from the inside. And what's the last one? Faith, that comes from the inside. But you're not concerned about the inside. You're more concerned with impressing people that you tie all the way down to your garden herbs. And God said, woe to you. That's the woe of pettiness. The woe of pettiness. Here's a quote. They majored on the minor things and minored on the major things. Everybody okay? I said they majored on the minor things and minored on the major things. By the way, just so I go ahead and help all of us, look what he does say though in verse 23. These ought you to have done. Now when I ask you, don't answer me out loud. Is he talking about tithing off the herbs? Is he talking about tithing off the herbs? Or, Miss Sheila, is he talking about tithing, or not tithing, but, but showing mercy, judgment, and faith? Either way it can go. And not to leave the other undone. So if the first phrase refers to love, mercy, and judgment, then the second phrase refers to the other one. And don't leave the other undone. But if you reverse it, am I making sense? And say, these all you'd have done, then he is talking about the tithing. And then the second phrase, Brother Bob Jackson, don't leave the other undone, love, mercy, and judgment. Either way, either way, God's saying be well balanced. God's saying if you want to tithe, that's good, that's all right. And see, there's some of you here tonight, I've preached it and 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 talked to some of you about it. To flat-footed, flat-footed, absolutely, without apology, unequivocally, still will not tithe your income to God. Shocks me. I don't understand it. I tell you this, you young couples. You young couples. First of all, tell your nagging wife to shut her mouth. Or or, if you're the wife, tell your God-robbing husband to straighten up. 
You say, you, yes, if you're the wife, tell your God robbing husband to straighten up. Yes. Before you get the curse of God on your home, before you get the curse of God on your family, before you have an emergency, you want to drop down on your knees to God, but yet you've got a barricade because you've been robbing God for years and years and years and years. And you know it's preached, and you know it's you know it's in the Bible. I said, you know it's in the Bible, you know it's in the Bible, you know it's in the Bible, but you're flat-footed, unequivocally, unapologetically, arrogantly, rebelliously say, it don't matter what the Bible says, it don't matter what God says, I'm going to do what I want to with my money. You better make sure you're not a Pharisee. You better make sure you're not a Pharisee. You say, you're making me upset. Well, I need to. I need to. I, I need to. I need to. I need to. We need to move some things around here. We need to move some folks to the altar. Amen. I'll tell you this, I'm going to move on because my message is not tied to the right. When you run out here and say that it is, you're not telling the truth because I've been preaching on the eight woes of the Pharisees. Right or wrong? I'll tell you this much. I owe God my life. I owe God my life. But I owe him no money. I owe him no money. Hurry back. I need your amens, okay? Show judgment, mercy, and, and, love, and faith. Judgment, mercy, hey, judgment, mercy, and faith. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> the woe of pettiness. Yeah, Brother Kevin, they majored on the minor, yeah. on the minor, and minored on the majors. Yeah, right. And I want to say to this church tonight, you should tithe. Yeah. Every family should tithe. Every individual should tithe. Yeah. But I want to tell you something else. We should show judgment. Right. And we should show mercy. And we should live by faith. Somebody say amen. That's the way to your matters of the law. And again, Miss Keisha, it goes back to this. I'm looking on the inside, the tithing parts on the outside. Amen. Let me tell you what they were doing. They said they set outward, I'm talking about the, the, the woe of pettiness. They set outward purity and decency above inward sanctification and purity of heart. They set the outside purity and decency, the tithing, above inward sanctification and purity of heart. In the outward form, it appeared they were consecrated or adorned. In the inner character, they were abominable and reprobate. They were careful about externals, but they were indifferent to essentials. They, they took care of the inward, I mean, but they took care of the outward as being everything, Brother Dennis, but the inward they thought nothing of. They were outwardly religious, but they were inwardly corrupt. Outwardly religious to tithe your in listen to you are outwardly religious to tithe your income to God and yet be full of corruption and pollution and deceit and trickery, conniving, manipulating, untruthful, lying, falsehood, uh, 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 just a schemer like Jacob, a schemer. Schemer. I've met people that always try to stay a step ahead of everybody else. You can't figure that thought pattern out. You know what it is? There's something wrong on the inside. There's something wrong on the inside. Is everybody okay? They focus their religious attention on matters that are minute. Let, let, let's get the next verse. You're not going to believe what this means. All right? Um, the, verse 23 is the woe of pettiness. Let's get verse, uh, uh, yeah, 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 verse 24. Look at verse 24 to show you the small thing. You're not going to believe what this means right here. I didn't know myself. Verse 24, everybody. You blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, what does that mean? You've heard it all. How many heard that all their life? You've heard it all your life. You strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what it means. I didn't know myself. When they would drink in, in the Eastern days, you know, no refrigeration, they would, and even their wine or their grape juice, somebody say amen, they would put, I didn't know this, they would put a cloth over the, the glass, a cloth. While, Brother Philip, they would drink the beverage, no matter what the beverage was, Miss Jackie, they put a cloth. What were they doing? They were straining at a gnat. 
The gnat was even the larvae that might have found its way into the beverage, into the liquid, as you all understand? Into the uh, material they were going to consume. So instead of drinking the larvae, they didn't want to be unclean. They didn't want no abomination from the Old Testament entering into them. So what they do, Brother Daniel, they put a cloth, I should have illustrated, and put it over, and that would be a strainer that would catch the gnat. Here's what he said, though. He said, let me tell you how much you major on the minors and minor on the majors. You'd rather strain a gnat and swallow a camel. And one author said, the hump and all. Say amen. <laughs> Making much of trifles, swallowing a camel, and making very little of a gnat. All out of balance. I probably didn't say that exactly right. I'll get it right one of these days. They got it all. They, in other words, they were putting the emphasis where it doesn't need to be. Now, I'm going to say something and some of you are not going to say amen. You're not going to. I can already tell you you're not going to. You say, you, you're going to preach that like that? I'm going to preach that way. And what I'm fixing to say, some of you are not going to say amen to. It's all right. I've got me a tape player up here with about 37 amens recorded. <laughs> now I'm fixing to hit it. No, I don't have one. You hold on, okay? The outside's important. The outside is important. But I'm under the firm persuasion it's not the most important. I'm proving it from this passage. The outside's important. And, and, and let me say this. And this is where I need your amens. We need to be careful to maintain an outward testimony. Right, right or wrong? Right. All of us need to, listen, we are the, we are the light of the world. Amen. We're the only epistle that's being read by this world. We're, hey, look at me. We are the epistle. Amen. They're not, leading, they're not reading, reading Galatians. They're not reading Ephesians. They're reading us. Miss Bonnie, they're reading us. We're written epistles known and read of, of how many? All men. So listen to me. The outside is important. Some of you need to understand that. Some of you need to reevaluate that. Somebody help me tonight. Some of you need to reinstitute that to your family. I said you need to reinstitute that to your family. Some of you need to adopt that. Some of you need to accept that. Some of you need to believe that. And all of us, all of us need to practice it. I'm talking about cleaning up the temple. I'm talking about looking right. I'm talking about dressing right. I'm talking about stop running around half naked. I'm talking about stop being out here in the world looking like you belong in the world. I'm talking about God's against it, the Bible's against it, Holy Ghost's against it. The outside is important. It's important. But it is not the epitome of our Christian life. The inside is equally or perhaps even a bit more important than the outside. And here's what I found out. You get that inside right, many times that outside will take care of itself. But now hold on, hold on. Here's a crowd. Here's a crowd. Daniel, they have the outside right. They tithe off their garden herbs. They strained at a knot, gnat but swallow a camel. They had the outside right. They had it right. But you see what God said? You've cleaned up the platter. You've cleaned up the sepulcher. You've cleaned up in front of men, in front of men. But inwardly, you're still polluted. I'm sorry, but I think we have people like that in our churches. I said churches plural. I believe we have them like that in our churches. I'm holding up the mirror all day long. I'm holding up the mirror. All day long, I'm holding up the mirror. I pray God you're not seeing yourself. I pray God you're not seeing your reflection. The woe of preventing. 
the woe of pretense, the woe of proselyting, the woe of perverting, the woe of pettiness. Look at verse 25. Let's go hurry up and finish in a minute. Look at verse 25. Everybody, verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within. I told you, didn't I? Right. Cleanse first that which is within. Within the cup, that the outside of them also may be clean also. The woe of priorities. The woe of priorities. Let me say to this congregation tonight, let me say to this congregation, there is such a thing as growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to realize that in this, this, this stuff, there is, there, is a, there is a growth process. We need to give people space and let them grow. Say amen. You let them grow. But, but don't, don't make it your priority to police the church. That's good. That's right. Yeah. Don't make it your priority to police the church. And let me tell you something. I guess I am the chief of police, but it's enough to wear you down. I want you to know that. It is enough to wear you down, the, 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 being the chief of police. And you've got to worry about how everybody's doing, how everybody's living. And I want to say another word about what I said this morning, because everybody just smiles and laughs. And that's how he's just preaching. But let me tell you what social media has done to our churches. I'm talking about all over the nation. All over the nation. It's probably the most destructive thing. It could have been constructive, but it's probably the most destructive thing that's ever been hatched out of here. People to get on there, and I'm going to name it, help me with them again. I don't care if it's Facebook. I don't care if it's Snapchat. I don't care if it's, uh, uh, help me with the other ones. Instagram. There's a, a couple more. Twitter. Any more? All of it. All of it. You get on there. You do things you shouldn't do. You show things you shouldn't show. You pass things along you shouldn't pass along. You copy other people with it. You think it's funny. You think it's a joke. You think it's something to laugh at. You think it's something to impress everybody with. I want to tell you what I think. I think it's wicked as hell is what I think. I think it's wicked as hell. I think it's wicked as hell. And if anybody's doing it, how about doing me a favor? Stop tonight. How about doing God and this church a favor? Stop tonight. I don't, I don't want to offend. What, you want to rather offend God? You'd rather offend God? You'd rather upset God? You'd rather grieve the Holy Ghost? You'd rather not care about your testimony? You'd rather not care about what people are, are seeing and, and what they're talking about and what they're relating and, 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 and God help, God help. Listen, man, why can't somebody just put on all that social media that we had a good family reunion with grandma? Why can't you do that? That's not, that's not tantalizing enough, is it? That, that don't get enough likes, does it? That don't get enough hits, does it? That, that don't get passed along. That's not exciting. Maybe, it's it. Maybe that's not fleshly enough. Maybe that's not fleshly. There's something wrong with people. There's something wrong with professing Christians that get on all this social media and pass all this trash around. Pass all this trash around. Just to see how many likes they can get. See how many friends they can have. Listen, if that's what friends are, I don't need friends. I don't want friends. I've got a church full of friends. I've got a church full of friends. I could care less what any of that crowd thinks about me. I could care less how many friends I've got, how many like. I don't need followers. I've got enough followers to give an account of right now. I don't need followers. Some of you live for that stuff. You live for it. You, you revel in it. You glory in it. You eat it up. You, it's your life. It depresses you. It upsets you. Nobody responded. Nobody said anything. Nobody is my friend. Nobody likes me. Nobody, nobody give me any hits on that. See, you're consumed with carnality. You're consumed with carnality. Get your face. Get your face on Facebook and get your face in the book. It might help your marriage. It might help your relationship with God. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I just said the wrong thing. There ain't no mind about it, it will help your marriage. It will help your family. It will help your self-esteem. It will help your Christianity. Hey church, hey, clean up our lives, clean up our lives. 
Clean up all the bull that's, that people are putting up with. Get rid of this mess. Stop this mess. Stop it. It's ridiculous. It's not Christian. It's not holy. It's not godly. It's not purity. Some of the selfies, some of the selfies are enough to turn my stomach. Your lips all pooched out. Your boobs showing. Your rear end, your rear, your rear, your rear end pooched out. Is that, if that's Christian, I quit. I quit. If that's Christian, I'm done. I resign if that's Christian. It's not Christian, Brother Randy. It's not Christian. It's not godly. It's not holy. It's not purity. It's not sanctification. It's against everything God stands for. You mean to tell me the gauge of your happiness is whether or not how many likes or followers you have? And I'm going to tell some of you women something. Some of you are married. You're married. You're married. You're married. People put ridiculous stuff on there. And I'm going to tell you again, some of it's aimed at me. And I'm tired of that too. I'm tired of being picked on. I'm tired of being picked on. I haven't done nothing to nobody but try to love people and preach. I'm tired of people throwing things at me on Facebook. I'm tired of it. But let me tell you what else I'm tired of. I'm tired of somebody make some jackass comment and some of our people say, I like that. I like that. Your, where's your where's your husband? Where's your Christianity? Where's your godliness? Where's your holiness? Once you get some guts and say, I don't like you saying that. Get some guts. Get some guts. Clear the air, okay? I'm clear the air. If anybody in this church is passing around nudity? If anybody in this church is passing around nakedness, if anybody in this church, if anybody in this church is putting pictures of drinking, if anybody in this church is putting pictures of rebel rousing, you are not right with God. You're not right with God. You're not. You're not. You're not. In light of everything I've said tonight, the outside is still important. Yes, yes, but, but, now help me, right? Help, don't die on me, don't die on me. God wants the inside right. He wants the inside. He wants the inside. Do you major on the minors? And minor on the majors? Oh, yeah. I wish everybody was in town. Break, break yeah. Yeah. Why would you say that? Because everybody needs what I'm preaching. Break. The world of priorities. How many times this morning did I talk about lying? How many times this morning did I talk about lying? Tell me. Tell me how many times. Yeah. Enough that some of you are sick of hearing it. Come on. Preach. 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 Preach, dog. What good are you to sing in this church if you're a liar? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Everybody don't get distracted. Look up, everybody. Preach. 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 What good am I to stand behind this pulpit if I'm a liar? Right. Right. What good are you to teach that class if you're a liar? Right. Johnny, what good are you to be an usher and you walk down here in front of everybody but people know you're a liar? Uh, or Jennifer knows you're a liar. I've got a real problem with people that lie all the time. I've got a real problem with it. I've got a real problem with it. You know why? Because God has a problem with it. And I think some folks have lied so long 
it's such a habitual practice for them that now when they do lie, they don't even realize they're lying. It's a destructive pattern. Destructive pattern. We'd rather stand, we'd rather climb a tree and tell a lie than stand flat foot on the ground and tell the truth. Everybody okay? You young people. You represent our church. You sing in this youth choir. You sing in this youth choir. You go to all these churches. You go to all these different churches. They see you singing, but they also probably see your Facebook nonsense. They see it. They see it. Look at verse 27, everybody. I'm going to finish. I do want to finish. He said, cleanse the cup and platter. That's 26. But look at verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes, hypocrites, Pharisees, for you're like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful. I didn't get that word this morning. They appear beautiful outward. They appear beautiful, everybody. But are within, full of dead men's bones and all unclean. In verse 28, even so you also outwardly appear righteous unto men. You appear righteous. Within a year, full of hypocrisy and iniquity. That's the woe of pollution. I do have an outline. The woe of pollution. Polluted on the inside. But the word is beautiful on the outside, and the word, look at this, righteous, Brother Randy Jr. Beautiful and righteous. This will is beautiful and righteous, but polluted on the inside. I can see a little boy going up to one of them whited sepulchers, and it's all mother. They did that one time a year, Miss Keisha. They did that to to let those whited to, to let the sepulchers, Brother Mike Kester, stand out, so they would appear to be beautiful. But they did it for another reason. This is un- unbelievable, Miss Krista. They painted them, Brother Randy, so that they would stand out to such a degree that people wouldn't be up against them and follow them. They'd stand out so much that you wouldn't get, get around the dead corpse and get defiled. So there was a purpose, Brother Bruce Mabry, in doing all that. But the, the point is that, that, that inside, I can see a little boy walking up to a white and says, my, my daddy, that's pretty, that's beautiful. Can, can, we, can, we, can, 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 can we can we go inside? Can we go inside? Oh, no, 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 you can't go inside. Why, why, why daddy, why? why? What's inside? There's people's bones in there. Yeah. Dead people's in there. And he's, oh, okay, I don't want to go in there because that would defile them. Yeah. And that's the woe, Miss, Miss Jimenez, of pollution. Everybody thinks you're beautiful spiritually. And everybody thinks you're righteous. But you're polluted. You're looking at pornography. You steal from people. You lie to your family. You're sneaky. You're a schemer. You're a manipulator. You're a fake. You're a pretender. You're not real. You blow up every time everybody turns around. That's what your children know you are. You blow up every day of your life, and they see it every day. Why can't he get straight? Why can't she restrain her? Why is she always going off on daddy? Why is she always going off on daddy? Why can't she be tame? Because there's pollution on the inside. There's something wrong in here. Dead men's bones. know what I say to my family. Ask them all what I say to my family about some individuals. I said this today. I said it yesterday. I think they don't have the power to change. They don't have the power. People I've met in my life don't have the power. Some don't have the power. You know why? Because there's something missing on the inside. As long as there's something missing, as long as there's something missing, Miss Heather, guess what? It's going to be pollution on the inside, but beauty and righteousness on the outside. I'm finished. Look in verse 29. This is unbelievable. Verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And they say, if you say, if we'd been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them. In other words, we, we wouldn't have killed them. We, we decided against our own people and, and not kill the prophets. He said, verse 31, you witnesses unto yourselves that you're the children of them. He said, Jesus said, you're, you're the children of that crowd that killed them. And then he said, verse 30, fill you up the measure. In other words, you're fixing to fill up the measure of your fathers. You're going to bring it to full fruition because you're fixing to crucify me. You're fixing to crucify me. 
And then he said, verse 33, you serpents, you snakes in the grass, you snakes in the grass, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's the woe of pretense once again. Pretense, what I mean by that, that means that they attempt to make something that is not the case appear to be the case. And what would that be? That they love the prophets, that they love the men of God. Right. They love the men of God. Do you mean to tell me it's possible to have every CD and every tape of some evangelist that you favor and that you're enamored with and you love, and yet you still have all that wickedness inside of you? Yes. Yes. Because you don't really believe half of what he preaches. Because if you believe half of what he preaches, it changed your life. It changed your life. I got a handheld mirror. I got a handheld mirror. Thank you. Makeup. It's all right. That's what women do. What do you see? see yourself and what I've been preaching all day. You better, you better get in this altar. Come on, Lord. You better get in this altar. Everybody look at me. You better get in this altar. Well, I, I'm not, I don't have all eight of them. I've got six. I've only got, I'm only, I'm only, I'm only find myself about three of those. Three out of eight, really? That's not good odds. What do you see? Some of you may have a teenager here tonight. You may have a teenager. You may have a teenager. You say, I can't do nothing with her. I never know when she's telling me the truth. I never know when he's telling me the truth. My, t my own teenager. I can't believe a thing they say. You know why? You know why? The inside's not been taken care of. It's not been taken care of. And there's pollution down there. Let's pray. Let's everybody pray. Let's everybody pray. Ben, come up here and pray again, please. Pray for us, Ben. Pray again, please. God, we love you tonight. God, we've seen, Lord, Lord, what your word shows us this evening. I ask you, God, for conviction from a holy God. Lord, would you show every heart. God, would you not let us, Lord, kick it to the curb or to the side, but God, we'd see exactly what thus saith the Lord. God is so easy. God, in this day of abundance, Lord, and, and, and busyness, God, to get our minds on other things, but God, tonight, would you arrest the attention of those that you preach to tonight? God, would you bring them to an altar of repentance? Yes, God, would it. you break that's their it. heart and conviction? God, we beg you in Christ's name. God, you've preached to the Mount View Baptist Church tonight, and I ask you, God, for every heart that's standing in need of the preaching, I ask you, God, in Christ's name. God, for your son's sake, God, would you break their heart and Holy Ghost Power conviction, God, here tonight. God, we need your hand. God, in this Laodicean church age, no doubt in these last days, God, people just turn and do their own thing. God, not when we not do that, but God, when we turn and run into our Savior and our God. Lord, for the lost that are here, God, that you preach to, God, would you hit them in conviction? Lord, even now, God, would you make everything even that they now, do uncomfortable? Even now. God, until they get right with you, God, for those that are saved and clean right. in the name of Christ. Get right. God, would we clean our hearts and our minds up? God, where are we? God, honest, in front of you, Lord. I ask you, God, we'd measure ourselves by your own holiness, and God, we'd see how far, God, we come short to our almighty God. And I ask you, God, tonight, God, please, God, would you send conviction to our church tonight? God, this time, Lord, will we not be busy with what's going on tomorrow? What we're about to do when we leave here, but God, would we see ourselves standing before you tonight? 
God eternally, God, and we didn't see ourselves, God, a conviction. Help us, God, Lord. hang us, Please Lord, in conviction. Hang Please around our us. necks. Lord, a conviction of God. And I ask you, God, you do that tonight. Lord, those that are here, God, sin sick. God, would you help them, God, to come to an altar. God, we beg you. God, in this service tonight, bring us to an altar. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and sing all over the building. The altar is open for anybody and everybody. Let's Verse sing. 27. Sing it. Jesus is tender. Sing it out. Calling you home. Sing it out. Calling today. Calling today. Why from the sunshine of blood will thou roll? Father and Father away. What are you?